Hey, 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 Dr. DeMaio here again. This is your chapter four, Tissues, uh, your narrated version of the slides that I had made. I'm hoping that this goes through without me having to remake this whole thing again. So basically, there's four basic tissue types in the body. And uh, we distinguish a tissue based upon its structure and function or function and structure. And a big key is the cells. What cells are supposed to be there? And so we look at the cells and also their arrangement and how, how uh, densely they're arranged, um, the types of cells, the density of the cells. The second thing you may see on some tissues, especially if it's connective tissue, is some fibers. And we'll look at the types of fibers that are in that tissue, the density of those fibers as well. And the stuff in between is sometimes called the ground substance. We look at the type and density of that. And when we look at connective tissue, you combine the fibers and the ground substance, that becomes your matrix. So four types of tissues. Number one, epithelial tissue. It's a covering and lining tissue. It includes glands. Uh, subtypes are based upon shape, modification, and cells. The connective tissue... Um, is the second type and that's based upon cells fibers and ground substance the third type of tissue is muscles we have three types we have skeletal cardiac and smooth and then we have nerve tissue which is only one type of excitable cell which is the neuron and then there are six neuroglia or glial cells supportive cells epithelial tissue as we have said over and over again it is a covering and lining tissue. It covers the lining of surfaces. Now remember, you have outside surfaces and inside surfaces. So you have the skin on the outside, then you have the mucous membranes, and then you have the tracts, like the respiratory tract, the GI tract, and urinary tract, and the reproductive tract, and there are tubes within a tube. The human body is arranged in a tube within a tube arrangement. And those tubes are lined. So from the inside of your mouth all the way through your GI tract is lined with epithelial tissue. And same thing through your airways all the way down. And your skin has glands as well associated with it. So epithelial tissue can form glands as well. And so let's look at five things about epithelial tissue here. The first is that the cells are closely packed. They have to be. Otherwise you have leakage. You can't have tiles on the floor with a big gap or sheetrock on the wall with a big gap or a siding or a roofing that has a big gap and they all since they're covering something they have a free surface or an apical surface that's the top apices or apical surface and a basement or bottom basal surface now remember we have a basement membrane sometimes called the basal lamina right or the lamina propria so Number three, besides having an apical and basal, uh, basal surface, due to the avascular nature, and avascular means what? If something is avascular, it, has its, it does not have its own blood supply coming to it. It's actually going to receive blood through diffusion to the connected tissue that's connected to below. So the epithelial tissue is supported by the connected tissue below. There's a reticula and a basal lamina. It receives blood through diffusion from the blood vessels within the connective tissue. Now, number four, although they are avascular, epithelial tissue has good nerve supply, innervated. It contains no blood vessels, but there are nerves that go to the tissue. And fifth, epithelial tissue is regenerative it has a high mitotic rate. That means it will undergo cell division and repair very fast. And it has to be because you have these simple layers, meaning one layer thick of very fragile epithelial cells, like in your GI tract, especially in your small intestine. And that would cause havoc if it didn't repair, because then you would have big gaps and things would pass through that shouldn't. And it does happen to people. And if you ever heard of leaky gut syndrome, that's associated with so when we classify epithelial tissue, we look at simple versus stratified. This is showing you squamous epithelium. I know because it, the computer is trying to generate the squamous cell shape, which kind of looks like a fried egg. And the cells are very simple. There's a nucleus in the middle. 
uh, very thin, flat cells. They come together. They have a basal surface, an apical surface. They're closely packed to each other. It's kind of like tiling. And uh, stratified layers means you have one on top of each other. They don't all make it down to the basal surface. And later you'll see pseudostratified. It looks like it's stratified, but it's not. So the three basic shapes of epithelial cells are squamous, cuboidal, and columnar. And cube is, doesn't always look like a cube, kind of looks like a circle. And columnar doesn't always look a, like a perfect column. They're taller, you can see that. And squamous doesn't always look like that perfectly. They're very thin, uh, like a fried egg usually. So on this silly little chart, you see across the top the name, cells, layers, modification. So how do we study tissue? We're going to look at the name of the tissue. What's the name of this tissue? What cells would you find in that tissue? If you were a pathologist or a histotechnologist working for a pathologist, you would be looking at a tissue sample and you better find the parenchymal cells. Remember we learned that term, parenchyma. Parenchyma means the normal tissue cells that should be there. So if you take a pap smear on a patient, there better be squamous epithelial cells there. If you see other cells that are not supposed to be there, we got a problem. And so we look at the cells uh, the cells would be tightly packed squamous cells for simple squamous. For stratified, also tightly packed. And for keratinized, you have uh, squamous cells, but then eventually they're going to become keratinized and they get filled with the waxy like substance called keratin. It's a protein. It gets injected into those layers and many layers of waxy, wax filled cells and they're dead. So simple squamous, tightly packed simple squamous cells one layer thick you see the layers if it's stratified there's more than one layer if it's keratinized you'll be a lot of layers thick with dead cells okay so are there any modifications on any of these simple squamous epithelium there's no modifications no cilia no microvilli or anything like that same thing with stratified squamous no modification but the skin is modified because it's filled with keratin also you have the ducts for sweat glands and oil glands coming out. You have hair coming out of the skin and you have the melanin that in, becomes pigmenting the skin as well. So that's how that's modified. Um, so now let's look at simple squamous epithelium. Where might you find it? Very commonly in all your vessels, your blood vessels and your lymph vessels. And in the kidney, the glomerulus is surrounded by these simple squamous epithelial cells. So it also is found lining all the lumen of all your blood vessels and the heart itself, lining the inside of the heart. It's also found forming the serosa. The serosa is a membrane surrounding the body cavities, such as the abdominal pelvic cavity, the thoracic cavity, the pleural cavity, the pericardial cavity. And also on top of the serosa, it forms the visceral membrane on top of all those organs. So every organ has this very thin layer of simple squamous epithelium, which produces a serosa fluid. The simple squamous epithelial cells produce that very thin watery substance. So here's an example of simple squamous epithelium, single layer flattened cells. A function is to allow materials to diffuse through. It's, for, it's in sites where protection is not so important, but secreting lubricating substance such as the serosa is important. Found in the kidney glomeruli, the air sacs of the lungs, and the air sacs of the lungs, they're modified. There's specific ones modified to make the exchange for oxygen occur on, their, on those cells. So the, those cells get um, covered with a serosa and a fluid, and they're in the alveoli, and on the other side, inside, it would be connected to a capillary behind it. And as the oxygen goes from a gas and the air, it disperses on the top of the surface like a puddle, and then it's taken up by the capillary behind this tissue. And then that will eventually drain into the heart, and then the heart will pump it through the rest of the body. Um, it also, it lines all your blood vessels, like I said, it lines the inside of your heart, and uh, all the lymph vessels specialize in the lymph to be like uh, overlapping, and they open like a doggy door when the pressure outside is high. And of course, like we said, lining the ventral body cavity, all the serosa. Stratified squamous is going to be found where there's going to be some protection needed. 
Now this is just stratified, it's not a keratinized form, so would this be on your outside of your skin? No, it would be in your mucous membranes from your mouth all the way down, all the way down through the uh, esophagus as well, and uh, coming to the stomach. So it's lined with this stratified squamous epithelium that protects from abrasion or irritation. It's a non-keratinized form of stratified squamous epithelium going from the mouth all the way down the esophagus. Also, you find this in the vagina and also forms, eventually will form the, the epidermis, but then it will be keratinized. Cuboidal epithelium, you have simple and stratified. Now notice the stratified will only really get stratified up to like two layers. So you're not gonna see this massive stratification of cuboidal cells anywhere. But simple cuboidal cells are closely packed, single layer, no modification. Stratified cuboidal cells, closely packed, same thing, usually two layers. And they're usually found surrounding the lumen of a gland, the inside of a gland's tube. So what you're seeing here is simple cube-like cube cells, cuboidal epithelium, and this is surrounding the kidney tubules. These tubules are tiny microscopic tubules found within the filtering structures of the kidney called the nephron. And so inside this nephron, blood is coming to them, and then it has these collecting duct. It has the glomerulus first, like a cup, then it runs down a tube with a loop going up and down and gets all looped around. So you're looking at here where it says simple cuboidal cells up on the right. Those are cross sections of those tubules. And you can see surrounding the cross section are the simple cuboidal cells. It also helps to form the secretory portion of glands and the ovary surface. So simple cuboidal epithelium found lining kidney tubules is a good one. Also found lining the ducts of glands. Its function is secretion and absorption. You know, when things filter through the kidney, you have to release some things and keep things back. So you're going to keep stuff and release stuff. So they're, they're specialized for that. Stratified cuboidal are usually found in the sweat and mammary glands like the breast, and they're usually only two layers thick. And they're more rare. Columnar epithelium. These are column-shaped cells. And if it's simple, it's just one layer, no modification. Stratified means there's layers, no modifications on the top. And then you can have microvilli, which are common in the small intestine. You'll have a sim simple columnar epithelium with microvilli lining the first part of your small intestine. And the microvilli increase the surface area for absorption. So as the food enters the small intestine, it's going to be changed in the stomach with uh, en enzymes in your mouth with enzymes, your stomach with enzymes, and the pancreas and the gallbladder. It's going to go into that small intestine as chyme, and that's going to be like this mucus-like uh, substance. Let's not call it mucus. It's kind of like a like a, a shake, let's say, like a uh, like a shake consistency, and you can't really make out what's in there. And that's going to enter and it's going to be falling into the spaces of the microvilli of the plica circularis. Oh, that's a big word. The plica circularis means when you look, when you cut a small intestine in half and you're looking at the tube and you're looking at a cross section, you'll see it's folded like little mountains. And that's called the plica circularis. That increases surface area too. And then these columnar epithelial cells are sitting on top like cat in a hat houses. And then on top of the house has the microvilli. So really designed for lots of absorption, that whole area. And it's a simple layer, but it's designed to absorb lots of nutrients. A stratified columnar has layers of columnar epithelial cells. A ciliated columnar epithelium has these cilia on the top, which have protein motors, and they actually push things along. You find them commonly respiratory tract and reproductive tract. And then pseudostratified means that the cells look like they're stratified, but they're not. It's actually a single layer. And usually you find this in the trachea when you have pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. That's a mouthful, right? Just learning to say it helps you. So here's simple columnar epithelium. It's more for absorption. It's hard to make out that microvilli. The center is the lumen 
of the stomach in this case, and you'll see um, mucus cells inside producing a lot of mucus on these. Doesn't really show it too well here, but it's found lining most of the digestive tract from the stomach to the anus. Also lines the gallbladder and some ducts of the glands. The ciliated variety lines small bronchi, uterine tubes, and some regions of the uterus. Here's a stratified columnar epithelium, and this you might find in uh, pharynx and epiglottis, the mammary glands, salivary glands, and urethra. And this is the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And this is found lining mostly the trachea. You can find it in portions of the male reproductive tract as well. Notice the cells all make it down to the basement membrane. Transitional epithelium is um, unique cells that actually, when they're at rest, they're piled on each other like a pile on in football. Imagine all guys on a football team on top of each other trying to get a loose ball. And then when they're relaxed, they're stretched. I'm sorry, when it's filled, when the, when the bladder is filled, it stretches them out like they're lined up at the uh, line of scrimmage. So um, transitional epithelium kind of look cuboidal, but then they kind of stretch out and look different. So these are found in the bladder, the urethra, and the ureters. Here you see it at rest on the right, like a pylon. Okay. Glands. A gland is one or more cells that makes and secretes an aqueous fluid. You can have a single gland, single cell gland, and that's found inside the columnar epithelial cells, by the way. So they're classified by the site of product release, whether they're endocrine or exocrine. And we learned about the difference between endocrine and exocrine. Endocrine means the cells produce their product and they get released and they eventually end up entering the bloodstream traveling to a distant target cell that has a receptor for that specific hormone. So when you think of endocrine, you think of hormones. When you think of exocrine, the cells produce their product and they go out through a duct onto a surface, kind of like a sweat or an oil gland or a mammary gland. And even in your ears, the ceruminous wax glands are like that as well. So on the left, it shows you endocrine. On the right, showing you exocrine. Let's look at endocrine on the left. Endocrine is ductless. There's no ducts. And those glands produce hormones. Some of those secretions could be amino acids, proteins, glycoproteins, and steroids. Exocrine glands on the right are more numerous than endocrine. They secrete their products onto body surfaces through a duct. They have to go through a duct. Examples would be the mucus, sweat, oil, salivary glands. And the only important unicellular gland is the goblet cell, which is found within the columnar epithelial cells. And then you can have multicellular exocrine glands composed of a duct and a secretory unit. Different modes of secretion, merocrine, holocrine, autocrine. Merocrine means that the cells produce their product and they're secreted just through exocytosis, just like we've always learned. And then they'll eventually go in a duct usually, or somewhere. So in the pancreas, they're producing their product. They could be producing enzymes. If it's a holocrine, it means the products are being secreted by the whole cell rupturing. So it builds up in the cell and the cell ruptures. And so here you see these secretory vesicles on the left being released through exocytosis. But on the right, you see apocrine, the very top of the whole cell is being ruptured. So you have holocrine, apocrine, and merocrine. So the one on the left is a merocrine-like release with, with a, like normal cells doing exocytosis. The one on the right is a apocrine that the very top, the apical surface erupts. And then if it was a holocrine, the entire cell would erupt. So connected tissue, let's talk about that. Connected tissue is found throughout the entire body. It is the most abundant and widely distributed in primary tissues. You have the connected tissue proper, which is made up of loose and dense connected tissue. There's subheadings under there. You have cartilage, three types of cartilage. There's hyaline cartilage, fibrous, and elastic. 
You have bone, two basic types, compact and spongy or cancellous bone. And then you have blood, which is a liquid connective tissue. And I want you to add one more here is lymph. Lymph is a liquid connective tissue too. So here is the chart right out of the book. You have the embryonic tissue, mesenchyme, which is the stem cell for all connective tissues. And then they would create the blast cells. A blast cell is a young, immature cell. So you have fibroblast, which will become a fibrocyte. Chondroblast will become chondrocytes. Osteoblasts will become osteocytes. Hematopoietic cells will become blood cells. So let's look all the way to the left. The fibroblast becomes the fibrocyte, which is the parenchymal cell for the connective tissue proper. So if you're looking at any of those connected tissue propers, that means loose or dense. And under loose connected tissue, you have three types. You have areola, which we looked at with all those different cells in the lab. You have adipose, pure adipose tissue. And then you have pure reticular tissue. And then you can have dense connected tissue, which includes re dense regular, dense irregular, and then uh, its own tissue called elastic tissue. So all of those tissues you see on the left, all the connected tissue proper tissues have as their parenchymal cell that better find it in there is the fibrocyte is the mature one. The fibroblast is the young one. Look at, let's look at cartilage. So you have chondroblasts become the chondrocyte. That's the mature, mature cartilage cell. And you have hyaline cartilage, fibrocartilage, and elastic cartilage, three types. And we'll look at what determines the difference between those three. It has to do with fibers and the arrangement and, the, and how much uh, cells. Osteoblasts become osteocytes. Osteoblasts are the immature bone cell and osteocytes are the mature bone cell. These are just one bone cell, but the main one, the one that maintains the physiology. It is the parenchymal cell of bone. And you see it in compact bone and in spongy bone or cancellous bone. When they say spongy, it doesn't mean it's soft. We'll talk about that. Hematopoietic stem cells are the stem cells that will become all the blood cells, and that's where blood cells come from. So when you look at blood, we look at the cells and the plasma. There's no fibers in blood. So the cells are the blood cells, red and white blood cells, and then the plasma is the matrix that it's in. It's or the ground substance. It's more fluid. It's mostly water. So whenever you study connected tissue, we look at cells, fibers, and ground substance. The cells could be any of the blasts, and then they could become mature and become sites, right? So blast means immature. C-Y-T-E means mature cell. Blast usually does all the heavy work, laying down the tissue. The site is the mature cell that has to maintain the physiology of that tissue. Fibers, there's collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and reticular fibers. And each tissue has different amounts and different concentrations thereof. And ground substance is the material in between. And we don't get too crazy with the different types of ground substance, but we have this thing called GAGs. Yeah, I said GAG. G-A-G, which means glycose amino glycans. It's a sugar, protein sugar. That helps to give it this nice material to adhere to in between. Okay, so let's look at the cells. Fibroblasts are part of the connective tissue proper. Chondroblasts become cartilage. Osteoblasts become bone. Hematopoietic stem cells become the blood cells. And that would include your white blood, white blood cells, your plasma cells, your macrophages, your mast cells. And here is the CT proper image. Now we went over this in a lab and we're going over it again. This one's a nice full slide. We don't have any problems with this slide, right? So as you look at this slide, it, what captures you right away is the big striped thick fibers. Those are collagen fibers. Collagen fibers are very strong. And like I always say, how strong are they? I'm glad you asked. They're so strong that if you built a column or a beam out of it, and you built the twin towers with it, a plane would bounce off of it because they're so strong. And they're actually a cord of three proteins. 
So collagen protein fibers will give strength to things. And you notice it's not all collagen fibers here. There's just scattered collagen fibers. And then the other fibers up top is the reticular fibers, which helps to form the stroma. We talked about that stroma deal. Stroma would be like a very loose framework. Now, there is a tissue we're going to talk about called reticular tissue, which has reticular fibers and reticular sites. But when you look in the connective tissue proper, there's a little bit of like a, a very thin fiber mesh of reticular fibers throughout to help capture things in that area. Like cells have to be like a spider web almost, right? It gives a little consistency to keep things adhere to each other. So, I mean, how else is your skin going to attach to your body wall without something like this, right? And then on the left, you see a melanocyte. That's a very specialized cell that produces pigment and uh, melanin. And by the way, melanocytes, I want you to know this, are the, all the races have the same number of melanocytes. There's no difference in the number of melanocytes. It's the difference in the production of melanin, and it's based upon genetic um, adaptations to environmental sunlight because me melanin actually protects all the underlying cells from UV light damaging the DNA. DNA is very fragile and so melanin is extremely important and guess what you need to make melanin? You need an amino acid. The amino acid tyrosine, I want you to know this, is getting converted uh, by an enzyme called tyrosinase and that converts the amino acid tyrosine into melanin and that is found within a structure within the melanocyte called the melanosome just like that spelled instead of the CYT at the end melano s-o-m-e so within the melanocyte is a melanosome kind of like a peroxisome so to speak and the melanosome is where uh, the, the cell converts tyrosine, which is an amino acid, into um, melanin in the presence of an enzyme called tyrosinase. You know, graying of your hair has to do with a lack of that enzyme. If you don't have that enzyme functioning your body, you will get gray hair. Interesting, right? And so the next cell to the right of that is the fixed macrophage. Now you have free macrophages all the way to the right there, you see it, and a fixed macrophage. First of all, the difference is not much. The fixed macrophage lives there. He's fixed. He doesn't move. The free macrophage could have been coming in because there was an infection and it's floating in and out. It can go in and out. It's mobile. And a macrophage is actually a white blood cell. And if it's a macrophage, it's usually a monocyte a type of white blood cell, big white blood cell. And you notice you see a lot of little vesicles within it. Those are probably lysosomes and peroxisomes because their job is to engulf bacteria, cellular debris, and destroy, break it up and reuse that material. So they will actually help to clean up areas. And then all the way to the right, you see another cell called the mast cell. Now, mast cells are very important because they have three basic things that they can do. Number one, they can release histamine. Histamine is associated with inflammation. And we talked about if you were going to get a, um, a allergy test, and they always do a control and they actually put histamine under your skin to see if it creates like a mosquito bite, which is called uticaria. It inflames up and it's itchy. Histamine does that. Histamine creates localized inflammation, which will attract cells to come in and take care of business. They also release heparin, and heparin can actually liquefy connective tissue. And the last thing that they store and release is nerve growth factors. So this cell stores and releases these products. Nerve growth factors are necessary for nerves to heal. The human nervous system cannot survive without nanograms of it. It's also a, um, it's a messenger uh, chemical that can trigger changes in the nucleus of tissues. It can also promote inflammation. It's usually associated with inflammation. And then you see a fibers there, the elastic fibers right next to it. 
Elastic fibers are another type of fiber that is actually really flexible. They can stretch up to 150% of their length and snap back without breaking as long as it's healthy and young. As you get older, your elastin protein of your elastic fiber starts to get weakened and your skin loses its turga and that's where wrinkles come from. Okay, then right below it, you see a fibroblast with the pseudopods attached to the collagen fiber because fibroblasts lay down the collagen fibers. And when they become mature, they become a fibrocyte. So you better see fibroblasts in this tissue because remember what we said, the fibroblasts are the parenchymal cell for the connective tissue proper. And then you see a mesenchymal cell, which is a, that is a stem cell for any connective tissue cell. And then below on the bottom right, it's showing a lymphocyte, which is a white blood cell. You can't tell what type of lymphocyte it is. This could be a B cell, it could be a T cell, and it could even be a natural killer cell. Now, let me tell you a little bit about B cells. If you look all the way to the left, underneath that melanocyte is a plasma cell. Now, we know it's a plasma cell because they're telling us, but look how big it is. It looks similar, it's just bigger. Plasma cells are mature B cells that now live in the tissue. See, B cells are called B cells because they mature in the bone marrow. T cells are called T cells because they mature in the thymus. And B cells produce the antibodies. When they go to the tissue that they're going to help fight the infection that they were coded for, they will live there as a plasma cell. Natural killer cells are cells that are found in connective tissue alone. And you can have T killer cells as well, and you can have T helper cells. So we're not sure what that lymphocyte is on the bottom. It could be a natural killer cell. It could be a T cell. It could be a T killer or a T helper. Um, so we just call it a lymphocyte. And then in the middle, you see the big adipocytes, the big fat cells filled with triglycerides, pushing the nucleus to the edge in a structurally type of similar to a ring. So they call it the signet ring formation because the triglyceride fats are pushing the nucleus to the edge. And then the bottom, you see a collapsed vein or venule. I know it's a venule because it's, it's larger lumen and very thin wall. It's not really showing it perfectly, but venules will collapse when you cut them in half because they're not thick and sturdy. When you look at the blood vessel to the left above that, that is actually an arterial because it maintained its nice firm circular shape and it should have showed a thicker muscular wall. Okay, so now let's talk about fibers associated with connective tissue proper. The collagen is tough, provides a high tensile strength. We said that. Elastic is long, allows for stretch up to 150% and snap back. And reticular, very delicate, and they usually form the stroma of glands and organs. The ground substance, otherwise known as the interstitial fluid in between spaces, has several things in there. I talked about the GAGs, the glycosaminoglycans. Another way of saying glycosaminoglycans is a proteoglycan, it means it's a protein sugar. When you say gag, it's sugar, it's telling you it's sugar, amino acid, and sugar. And then you have your adhesion proteins such as fibronectin and laminin. You may hear about that someday. It's little adhesion proteins helping to keep everything together. Well, the ground substance of the connective tissue proper functions as a molecular sieve, sieve so that nutrients can diffuse in and out from the capillaries. So there's different types of connective tissue proper. The loose connective tissue proper that we just saw had those all those cells we went over. Okay, this kind of just summarizing. The ground substance is the proteoglycan or GAGs. Here's another image of that same thing. This is showing a micrograph, an actual micrograph. It's widely distributed under your skin or under any epithelia. It helps to form the lamina propria of the epithelial tissue and um, of the mucous membranes and packages organs and surrounds capillaries. Here's the adipose, which is a type of connective tissue proper. That's just pure adipose tissue. 
we know we see it in our abdomen, some of us more than others, unfortunately, and in the breast and around your eyeballs and all over the body. You need fat for a little bit of cushioning. Okay. And then this is the connective tissue proper called reticular tissue. This is a unique tissue that's found in lymph organs or lymphoid tissue, lymph nodes. The spleen is a lymph organ. The thymus is a lymph organ and it's for filtering. You can see it looks like a big filter. You have these reticular fibers with reticular sites, the tiny little cells, and then there will be white blood cells in there such as mast cells, but macrophages will be in there and to help engulf any material. So this is, um, the spleen is actually made up of this kind of tissue. And so are lymph nodes and tonsils and the appendix. The connective tissue proper dense now. We have a dense regular and a dense irregular. The dense regular helps to form tendons and ligaments and what's called an aponeurosis. That's a big word for a broad, flat tendon. You know, if you looked at the picture of a person's muscles on their head, you see the muscle of the frontal muscle, the frontalis, and the muscle in the back, the occipitalis, and in between is a aponeurosis, a big, broad, flat tendon. If you look at the side of your hip and went down to your knee, you have this thing called the iliotibial tract, which is a big, broad, flat tendon. It's an aponeurosis. And even in the abdomen, when you have this linear alba, which it goes right down the center of your abs, and all the muscles of the abdominal muscles come to that. It's a big, broad tendon called an aponeurosis. So when we have dense connected, connected tissue, irregular is different. So we looked at regular forms, tendons and ligaments, whereas irregular has a mishmash pattern. What do I mean by that? If you think about um, looking at a nice wood with a nice grain, that would be more like dense regular, like a pine or an oak. But if you looked at um, plywood, it's all pressed together in all different directions. And plywood has a lot of strength, by the way, because it can withstand stresses in all different directions. So sometimes you'll see dense irregular connective tissue over an area that needs strength. So this is found in the submucosa of the digestive tract, the fibrous capsules around organs and joints. And also, I want you to add to this it's found covering the pericardium as the fibrous pericardium. It covers the pericardium as the fibrous pericardium. Remember when you, we went into the cavities of the uh, thoracic cavity, had the pericardial cavity, but there was a fibrous pericardium and then a serous pericardium. And that fibrous pericardium was strong, adhering up and attaching the heart to the sternum. So it doesn't bounce right out of the chest. And then on every bone, believe it or not, and on every cartilage, like a, there's a covering. So on the bone, you have a fibrous periosteum. And on some cartilage, you have a fibrous perichondrium. So that's made up of this type of tissue. It's like a strong fibrous tissue. Lots of collagen fibers going in different directions. Now let's look at the different types of cartilage. There's three types of cartilage. We have hyaline, which is the most common. The most common type of cartilage in the body is hyaline cartilage. The entire human skeleton, with the exception of the cranial bones, that's the top of your head, and the collarbone, believe it or not, are formed in, as a hyaline cartilage template. Then it becomes bone. The top of your head is a membrane, and so is your cartilage, uh, your collarbone before it becomes bone. So hyaline is the most common type of cartilage. You find it as you grow up and the bone fully grows, your growth plates were actually made up of cartilage, the places where it's growing. And then on the surfaces where they connect to each other, it's hyaline cartilage remains on there, kind of like Teflon. And then you have hyaline cartilage between the ribs and the sternum, the costochondral junction. And you have like hyaline cartilage that helps make the septum of your nose. So hyaline cartilage is very common. Elastic car cartilage is the weakest type. 
it's only found in certain areas like if you take your ear you can bend your ear and as long as you were not a wrestler and you've got really damaged ears from wrestling too much i don't know if you've ever seen a wrestler like that but our ears are very flexible i'm so glad i didn't wrestle because my ear is still flexible now at 62 years old if i was a wrestler as a kid it would be like hard as a rock and look terrible so the elastic cartilage is very flexible it's weakest but it's flexible if you flare your nostrils right now that has elastic cartilage in it doing that allowing that your epiglottis which is uh you know covers the airway is elastic cartilage and so the fibrous cartilage is unique that is the strongest type of cartilage in your body and that's found in your intervertebral discs you know the discs in your spine and also in the pubic symphysis you also find fibrous cartilage as the menisci or the meniscus in the knee and believe it or not you have a meniscus in your wrist too and that is a stronger and there's another meniscus in your jaw between your mandible and your temporal bone the temporal mandibular joint has a meniscus in between so they're very strong now the meniscus of the vertebrae are unique in the way they're designed we talked about that notochord a little bit that becomes the nucleus propulsus of those discs so the disc has this gel like substance in the center that can actually herniate it can squirt out if it's damaged but it's a collection of fibrous connected tissue wrapping around the cartilage so car fibrous cartilage has lots of collagen fibers elastic cartilage has elastic fibers Highland cartilage has basically no fibers. Let's look at that. Okay, so if you look here, I'm going to see if I can use this pen. Let's see how that works here. Let's do it in black. If you look here, this is a circular area called the lacunae. These are all lacunae. And within the lacunae, I'll use a different color is this is the actual chondrocyte there's a chondrocyte within the lacunae can't draw too well with this mouse that's a lacunae all the way around and then within is the chondrocyte within the lacunae so chondrocytes will lay down the material in between the material in between all this material here all this material is actually chondroitin sulfate that becomes semi-solid so you have chondrocytes within lacunae chondrocytes within and then the chondrocytes are laying down this material it's kind of like if you were um if you were actually i'm just going to erase this if we can erase it Okay. it's kind of like if you were going to um lay down a floor and like a, a my friends have a restaurant they put a new floor down right so sometimes they use that really nice stuff that um and they like a epoxy and mix and it becomes hardened you know or like you ever see the top of a counter of a bar type of thing is very epoxy and thick so that's what this is this chondroitin sulfite and all the other stuff there is is made up of that type of material and um, this is all costochondral junction which is made up of this type of hyaline cartilage and it forms the embryonic skeleton as we said before and it forms the costal cartilage and also the the bridge of your nose it forms the septum of the nose the trachea has uh, hyaline cartilage and so does the larynx so it forms the ribs the cartilage of the ribs area okay let me erase that i'm getting pretty good now i didn't know i can use this pen okay elastic cartilage is very flexible because it has a lot of elastic fibers if you notice when you look at the last slide there was no fibers in hyaline cartilage and so now here again we're seeing lacunae here's a lacunae these are all lacunae here right lacunae lacunae lacuna matata and the lacunae is a space 
and in the center of the lacunae is the the chondrocyte right that's the chondro whoops chondrocyte within the center there they are there's two of them there chondrocyte so the chondrocytes are laying down the hyaline i'm sorry laying down the chondroitin sulfate and then elastic fibers are in between so these are all elastic fibers in between here and so what you're seeing here is elastic cartilage with chondrocytes within lacunae chondrocytes within lacunae and then the elastin fibers are in between and chondroitin sulfate and you see this at the external ear the, and the epiglottis right? okay so this is now fibrocartilage and on fibrocartilage again we're going to see lacunae there's a lacunae 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 i can't draw too well and do my best there's a lacunae and then within the lacunae you're going to see your chondrocyte chondrocytes within right chondrocytes within come on color chondrocytes within there chondrocyte within there chondrocyte within there whoops i can't draw and now you also have lots of collagen fibers let me use this color here so here's the collagen fibers going this way see all these collagen fibers here lots of collagen fibers going this way wrapping around and then if this was a complete picture of a fibrocartilage disc then the center would be a nucleus propulsus let's say this is the outside over here and the center would be somewhere around here there would be a gel like super ball in the middle if you ever taken a baseball apart you know that the inside of the baseball sometimes has a little ball inside there and in the disc the fiber cartilage disc there's actually a little tiny nucleus propulsus in the middle let's see if i can do it with black imagine that's the nucleus propulsus in the middle and if you had a herniated disc the material can squirt out to the front or it can squirt out to the back if it squirts out to the back it goes into the space where the nerves are and that's a problem let's clear that up so fibrocartilage has lots of collagen fibers with lacunae and scattered chondrocytes within the lacunae okay uh connected tissue bone or osteous tissue has um a unique arrangement because the bone has to be thick if it's um, going to be compact bone spongy bone is different so look at this bone over here on the left this is representing a humerus that's very humerus but I know because you have the humeral head here and this is where the elbow will be this is your upper arm and then you would have a space in between if it was growing there would be a cartilage space here but it's already fully grown so let's not worry about that so what we have here is a, a portion of this bone here you take a cut out of this bone and you look under a microscope and you see it's actually made up of many of these circular structures look like cross section of trees right and compact bone has this this structural functional unit called the osteon and in the center of the osteon is the central canal and going through the central canal would be an arterial a venule a nerve or a couple of nerves and lymph vessel okay whoops let's make a lymph vessel so the center here let's erase that for a second so this is this is called a osteon this is called another osteon this is called another osteon okay so you have many osteons building building this bone to be thicker and in the center of the osteon is something called the haversian canal or central canal that haversian canal is going to have blood coming through there that blood is going to come through a, uh, an arterial 
and it's going to go out through these little tiny canals called canaliculi. You see those canaliculi going out. And the canaliculi will go to a lacunae, and the lacunae are these little tiny things here. You see those are little lacunae. And in the center of the lacunae is going to be a osteocyte within the center of the lacunae. So you have a central canal with an arteriole. It has also a venule. It also has a lymph vessel. And it will also have a lymphatic vessel going through. And the blood flow will go out to the cells within the lacunae through canaliculi. See, there's many canaliculi. All these thin lines are representing canaliculi. And the blood goes out to where they're living in these little spaces, and then there's an exchange occurring, and then the waste go back through the venous side and the lymph and goes back to the heart. So blood actually has a very good, I'm sorry, bone, even compact bone has a very good blood supply. It actually heals really well. Okay, let's erase that. I'm having fun now. I don't even know I can use this pen stuff. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next. Okay, so we have spongy bone and compact bone. Wait, wait, what the heck is this spongy bone? The name is called cancellous or spongy bone. Now, cancellous or spongy bone is not soft. It's called cancellous or spongy bone because when you look at it from the side, it kind of looks like a sponge. We have spaces in between. And it looks like there's a sponge from the side view. And those spaces are where the blood is, and the blood is formed in the cancellous bone. So they don't need to have a special blood flow going through a canal. They're surrounded, the cells are surrounded by blood all the time. So spongy bone does not, does not have osteons whereas compact bone does have osteons. And the compact bone gives a lot of strength, and it, but it doesn't undergo what's called hemopoiesis, which is blood formation. That's the formation of blood. I can't write with this stupid thing. And so cancellous bone is where you get hemopoiesis. Blood formation occurs in the cancellous, in the spongy bone that's where you're making all your blood and so the cells are surrounded by blood like a big vat of blood whereas in compact bone you got to pipe it in and that's what the haversion system you know what a haversion system is a haversion system is similar to what they have in israel you know in the desert they brought water and uh, i believe it's the romans did it they made these big haversion canals out of brick and stone and they pumped water into the city you got beautiful flowers and trees because of that and so compact bone is like a desert you know it's kind of like a desert but it needs blood supply so you have this aversion system called the osteon okay but both spongy and compact bone have these three types of cells let's look at the three cells of osteoblast which is the young osteocyte osteoclast and osteocytes and they both have collagen fibers and an osteoid matrix with calcium salts now i'm getting carried away with this thing huh okay Next. connected tissue blood so blood is a connected tissue it has cells no fibers though it does have a, um, a fluid, which is the plasma, which serves as the matrix or the um, uh, surrounding fluids, whatever you want to call it. And so here you see red blood cells. The red blood cells are these guys. This is a red blood cell, right? No nucleus, right? You can see there's no nucleus. The nucleus is gone. Where's the nucleus? That's a red blood cell. These are red blood cell, red blood cell, red blood cell. And then you have white blood cells. There's different types of white blood cells. This is a neutrophil. 
and sometimes they call it a PMN. You might see that someday next semester, or you may even see it on a blood result, you know, uh, elevated PMNs. What's that mean? It's not so fancy as you think it is. Polymorphonucleated. So the morphology or the shape of the nucleus looks like it has many nuclei, but it's really one. See that? Polymorphonucleated. And then this is a lymphocyte, and you can see the difference between his nucleus is big, right? This one is kind of weird. That's how you know it's a neutrophil. It's a big cell with this polymorphonucleated nucleus. Interesting, right? You learn something every day, right? All right. So blood has its formed elements, which are the blood cells. The red blood cells, another name for red blood cells is erythrocytes, right? And another name for white blood cells is leuco, means white. And you have leukocytes and lymphocytes, a little different. And so platelets are actually fragments of a larger cell called a megakaryocyte. Megakaryocyte forms the platelets. Actually, it's pieces of a gigantic white blood cell. And the plasma is the liquid matrix. It made, it's made up of proteins and nutrients and gases and waste and mostly water. It's like 90, 90 I would say 93 to 96% water. Maybe even more, some books. H2O. That's um, quality, found quality H2O, right? So you have the plasma, which is mostly water, but you have your dissolved uh, gases and proteins and stuff in there, and waste are in it. Let's look at muscle tissue. Muscle tissue, three types of muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Skeletal muscle makes up most of our body wall. Cardiac makes up the heart. Smooth makes up your glands. Also surrounds the lumen of uh, organs and vessels like the GI tract and so on and so forth. And even the pupils of your eye and the sphincters are smooth muscle. So here's cardiac, uh, skeletal muscle, excuse me. I know it's skeletal muscle because it's not branched. It's just a bunch of cells uh, that are long cylindrical cells going this way. And you see the actual, what you can see here is these striations going up and down. And then these are nuclei and skeletal muscle is multinucleated. And then you can have the cell inclusion. Let me just see if I can circle that cell inclusion right there. That's glycogen. Skeletal muscle stores glycogen. So you will see cell inclusions of glycogen in it. Okay. And this is cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle has intercalated discs. Intercalated discs are where those doo-doo-doos are or the gap junctions, and they're connecting one muscle cell to each other. It's also branched, right? So it's branched, like they have these branches. It looks like bamboo with branches, right? And the cells are attached directly to each other. They're also striated. You can see the striations up and down, right? It's not multinucleated, but sometimes there may be more than one nucleus. Smooth muscle has no striations. You don't see any striations in here. And you see that you found mostly in our, our organs. Okay. So skeletal muscle, long cylindrical, multinucleated cells, striated. All three are excitable tissues. All three are excitable. Whoops, let me go back. Can I go back, please? Oh. All right. All three muscle cells are excitable. So skeletal muscle is multinucleated, striated, under the control of your somatic nervous system. We'll talk about that. Cardiac muscle and smooth muscle is under the control of the ANS, the autonomic nervous system. That's involuntary control. But your skeletal muscle is under voluntary control. You actually are picking up your pen and writing it with your hand. You're thinking about it. But you don't have to think about digestion, you know, releasing certain acids. That's all under the autonomic nervous system. So skeletal muscles under voluntary control, which is under the 
somatic nervous system, SNS, and the heart and the and the uh, organs in your body, or the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle and smooth muscle, are under the control of the autonomic nervous system, things that happen automatically. Only one is not striated, that would be smooth muscle. Cardiac muscle is striated, and it has intercalated discs which connect each cell to each other with many gap junctions creating an electrical synapse between each other in other words when one cell contracts they all do this tissue slide here is the nervous tissue it's showing you neurons and axons i'm sorry neuron cell bodies and its axons so the cell body is where the nucleus and everything is. The axon is a long structure and even dendrites. It doesn't tell you exactly, but the typical neuron has a cell body with a nucleus and all its organelles, has dendrites coming to it or coming off of it, and then an axon that sends a message to another neuron or another target organ or gland. So the nervous system or the nerves, nervous system has only two types of cells and neurons are the only excitable cells. Now remember, there's two basic types of excitable cells in the body, that's muscles and neurons. And that would be all three types of muscles, cardiac, skeletal, and smooth muscle are all excitable cells, meaning they can have an action potential. And nervous tissue has two basic types of cells, the neurons and the neuroglia. Neurons are the only excitable cell within the nervous system. There are six types of neuroglia, four found within the central nervous system, or CNS, two found in the peripheral nervous system. The four in the CNS are, and if you looked at the original notes I had given you, uh, you would see on the bottom probably notes on both the cell and this one you'll see notes but you see the six types of neuroglia four in the central nervous system so the ones in the central nervous system will start from the top uh, astrocytes astrocytes help to form the BBB that is the blood brain barrier and it, it's actually a cells that wrap around any blood cells coming into the brain the capillaries and it actually monitors what comes into the brain as far as blood because the brain is separate from the rest of the body it has its own cerebral spinal fluid and so the astrocytes are protecting the what's coming in there and the only type of white blood cell really found in the brain is the microglia so the first one is astrocytes which helps to form the blood brain barrier and by the way the most common malignant brain tumor is an astrocytoma. Makes sense. Why? Because malignant means what? Spread. If you have cancer that spreads somewhere, it spreads through the blood and the lymph. As it goes through the bloodstream, it's got to go to the brain because the brain needs oxygen. So if there's any cancer cells in your blood, they may make it up into the brain. As they come there, who's going to take the shot? The doorman. So the astrocyte is like the doorman protecting the club from anybody coming in there. He's going to take the shot. And the shot in this case is cancer. So the cells become cancerous. And the most common malignant brain tumor is an astrocytoma. Now, if you, if you breach the blood-brain barrier, stuff can get in that's not supposed to get in there. For instance, if you had a wound of the spinal cord or brain and it bled, that blood would get into the brain and spinal cord area and these second cells called the microglia would attack the blood and also the blood would attack the brain and spinal cord and so there would be a big inflammation going on and damage because the, the systemic blood now just got in without passing through this filtering system of the astrocytes so astrocytes form the blood brain barrier they're, they're also the number one most common malignant brain tumor is an astrocytoma. Microglia are the white blood cells of the brain that are actually are phagocytic. They can engulf bacteria and so on and so forth. 
The third one in the brain is called the ependymal cell, E-P-E-N-D-Y-M-A-L. And ependymal cells line the ventricles of the brain and they convert your plasma into a specialized fluid called the cerebral spinal fluid. So ependymal cells make the cerebral spinal fluid. And then oligodendrocytes. Sounds like, uh, I love that name, oligodendrocyte mon. Oligodendrocytes are a blood cell, I'm sorry, are a neuroglial cell that wrap around axons in the brain and they myelinate the axons in the brain in a unique way. And that one oligodendrocyte will have many arms, kind of like an octopus, with one hand around one axon, maybe another hand around another axon. So they myelinate, they all join and myelinate an axon differently than the peripheral myelinating cell. So that was four CNS neuroglia. Let's talk about the two PNS, or peripheral nervous system neuroglia, and that would be Schwann cells. And a Schwann cell is one. A Schwann cell is the one that myelinates the peripheral axons, and they do it differently than the oligodendrocytes. And then we have satellite cells in the peripheral nervous system that we're still learning about they help to support the nerves. And here you see them again, a list. Astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, ependymal cells, and microglia. Schwann cells and satellite cells. Okay, thank you.